Hey, you guys, thank you so much for being here on Wednesday, just a couple minutes late. I wanted to apologize to those of you who are looking for the sex symbol, Tawny Katane. I've got somebody even sexier coming up in a little bit, but uh, Tawny's uh, had to reschedule. So she's going to be here March 31st, but don't turn off the camera because you guys are going to appreciate this next guest. But before I get started, I want to thank my buddies at Five Star Guitars right there. FiveStarGuitars.com slash All Access Live is going to give you a 15% off discount if you use this promo code below. So go to All Access Live dot, I'm sorry, FiveStarGuitars.com slash All Access Live and use All Access 15. It'll give you 15% off the accessories you find. They're about six or seven pages there full of goods and goods. Uh, they've got repairs then they've got lessons with pros like Jennifer Batten who happens to have her Guitar Cloud Symposium happening again on March 20th. This time she's got a deep dive event where she teaches you how to get the good gigs. So somebody that's played with Michael Jackson for a good long time and Jeff Beck, I think she knows how to do the good gigs. So she's going to be on with Kat Dyson from Prince and Pete Thorne, Chris Cornell's band, Jason Fellman from JFL Presents here in Portland and others. So go to guitarcloudsymposium.com and sign up for her deep dive event. Now, <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, we had a reschedule today and just like out of the blue, my dear friend, Missy Gordon, who is Tawny's talent agent, also happens to represent one of my favorite drummers from the 80s. So he uh, he's, sta he's standing in and uh, while he may not be sprawled across a Jaguar, he's going to come here and hang out with me right here. Please welcome Greg D'Angelo. How you doing, buddy? Oh boy, that is a scary thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got the uh, you've got the uh, uh, the sprinter back behind you there, so that yeah. uh, you, you, so are you a racing enthusiast? I am. Yeah, it's the oh. uh, the old three twelve back there, the old Ferrari three twelve, the legendary three twelve. Okay, yeah. I got a question for you. Um, sure. As a fellow drummer, right? Oh. Uh, I um I remember reading a hit parader article back in about 1987. One of the bands that I thought was most underrated, you might agree with me because, uh, you know, we could appreciate uh, their talent. I thought Y&T was one of those bands that probably should have been a lot bigger, right? Sure. I remember Dave Medicati in this article saying, I don't care about any other money. I, the, I want, my rock stardom is going to consist of a Ferrari. That's all he wanted was this Ferrari in his, in his garage. And I've met Dave a bunch of times and I, I'm afraid to ask him because I don't want him to feel like a failure if he hasn't gotten the Ferrari, right? But oh. maybe his priorities change. I'm sure. I mean, he could, but he's yeah, got maybe a, he's, so. I don't know. I've met him a couple of times and uh, we, we've never talked about it, but uh, I'm sure if he wanted it, he could have it. He could. He's got yeah. a, a great, he's got a vineyard. Yeah, he's doing all right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But so it's kind of cool to talk to people about their side hustle, right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, drummers and all the people that are, you know, sort of familiar with you from the uh, White Lion era probably didn't know about, you know, the earlier days with Anthrax and the later days with Zach mm. Wild. Um, I saw you with mm. Piercy um, during NAM mm -hmm. a few years ago. Um, you were down in uh, yeah. the, the Fullerton or something like that at the Fusion Club. You were playing with yeah, that's uh, right. uh, Steelheart. You, so um, that's and right. It was great, man. You uh, yeah. you tore it up. Um, oh, thanks. I, I found out that night too that you were um, you were a music director, kind of on that that run of shows with Steven. So we're gonna get to that in a minute. Sure, but I was sure. talking about the side hustle. It's kind of cool. So you've been doing something completely different the last several years. You got a recording studio. I I've had a recording studio um, since uh, I I don't have it anymore. I sold it, but um, I had a recording studio all through. Uh, the late nineties and the two uh, thousands. And um, it started with a, a little Porta studio and grew into a multi-room facility with two SSLs and a Neve and, and uh, all the headaches and, and glory that comes with that. Um, I had a great run. I'm sorry. Were you engineering in that room? I was engineering. I was wow. producing and, and, you know, honestly, you know, when I, when I talk about this, the, the most, um, fun part of that whole experience was it operated as a kind of like a boutique studio. So, you know, commercial, not really, but I brought in other, other uh, producers and uh, you know, the greatest fun for me would be, um, you know, sitting next to somebody like Ed Stasium or, or uh, Bob Clear Mountain when they were working and me just like sitting there and watching what they did. And then, uh, you know, after the session, I would stay up all night and, look at the EQs and say, oh, they did this to get that and they did this and that's how they do that. And it was an incredible educational experience. I had a great time doing it. 
that's kind of, you know, the opposite direction, right? I mean, you build a studio, you bring in the good guys and watch them. So did you have any formal experience? I mean, obviously recording you did, but did you have any training in, in engineering or? Zero. Uh, really? Nothing. I okay. went in, it was, it was a leap of faith. I, you know, I knew how to use uh, uh, a Porta studio when I started and um, I understood routing and reverb to a certain degree and compression, not so much and, and all these other, you know, gizmos in the studio but uh, you know as as time went on and as i got more and more exposure i you know knock on wood i got i got better you know yeah. and learned you know so yeah do you have uh when we bring bands in i know that you know a lot of studios will they'll have uh you know sort of a, an in with bands that just maybe get a development deal or they get signed and so the the back in the day anyway recording company or the management would say all right we got a budget for this record um, we're going to go to this studio. They've got kind of an in with that studio and, and you've got a lockout time for a while. Record deals are really no longer around anymore, right? So how are people, how were people finding you? And did you have like any notable national acts that came through and recorded? Sure. Uh, Michael Jackson worked at my place. Madonna what? worked at my place. Um, oh, uh, Motorhead worked at my place. Uh, um, but just a couple of small names. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 uh, <laughs> A lot of a, a ton of people. I mean, I'm sure I'm missing some of the gigantic ones, uh, but um, but uh, and not that those people they're obviously gigantic, but um, uh, you know, a lot of artists along those lines, and um, you know, and local bands and and uh, up and coming bands, and you know, everybody. We didn't discriminate. You know? I'm I'm interested in knowing if you kept all the outtakes from some of those uh, Michael Jackson and Madonna records, you know. <laughs> The, the the Michael Jackson and Madonna stuff went with the engineers that were I working. Bet. Yeah, I don't have I don't have those uh, those uh, beds. Um, but um, yeah, you know, I sold it in uh, two thousand five, and I wound up calling everybody that worked there who had stored stuff at my place, and I said, "Hey, we're shutting down. Do you want this? You know, when, it's a good time to come and get it because we're not going to be here." Um, so yeah, I don't have a lot of it anymore. I have some. I, I still have some Motorhead stuff. Do you? Some, yeah, I got some of Lemmy's lyrics, and you know. Oh, no kidding! Yeah, yeah. You and uh, Mickey D could probably uh, come cobble together some pretty cool memories from. Yeah, Mickey and I have been friends since the early '80s. He's so, yeah. such a sweetheart, man. That He's guy. The I, I yeah. think honestly, and as a, a, a Scorpions fan, right? Oh yeah, I, uh, there you I, go. I, I was. Uh, I was a like ridiculous Scorpions fan, to be yeah. honest with you. I mean, I, I went to germany as an 18 year old to try and find <laughs> it's a little embarrassing but uh i thought mickey redeemed the band honestly you know yeah. i really feel like uh coming great back fit. just a great fit. What, a, yeah. what a smart choice to have yeah him. yeah powerhouse man and, and and the energy is right like yeah. watching the camaraderie on stage yeah uh you know i mean as you know and uh you know folks that are gonna be watching this um if they're not musicians i've talked about the hang being so much more important than just musicianship, right? Like guys can have sure. amazing chops, but camaraderie and the um, the relationship you have, especially when you're out on the road, is so critical. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you know when I when I saw Mickey and Klaus and Rudy and Matthias, I mean those guys just looked like it was family. You know, for the yeah. first time in a long time. Yeah. Tell tell me about your musical experiences, man. Let's start back at the Anthrax days. So what was sure. that lineup like when you were in the band? Um, we were kids. We were 16, 17 years old, teenagers. And, um, uh, you're East you coast know, then East coast. Yeah. New oh. York city. And, yeah. um, you know, I met, uh, I met Scott Ian through a high school friend, you okay. know, who was uh, the other guitar player in the band at the time. And, um, you know, that's how that happened. It was, uh, it was really just kind of like a very natural progression from playing in cover bands with your friends in high school to, uh, you know, playing in a different band, an original band with your friends from high school. And um, that's kind of how that uh, grew. It was very, uh, very natural. At that point, you mentioned just being kids. Um, yeah. You know, the lineups changed a little bit through that band over time, different singers. and uh, But as far as like camaraderie goes, if you were that young, were you kind of in that spirit where it was, Three Musketeers, all kind of vibe, all for one, one for all. We're going to be the biggest, you know, we're going to be yeah. the Beatles. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It was, uh, you know, it, it was a lot of new experiences. There was a lot of new exposure. We were, uh, you know, starting to starting to mix in, in big boy circles, 
you know, in that band. Um, we would we would get out to Manhattan. We would go to we would go to clubs. We we started to develop the confidence of being of saying, well, where is it? What do we got to do? Where do we go? And uh, we chased it. You know, no, no fear. It was great. At that point, I mean, were you getting sort of support act gigs for to, you know for some of the nationals that were breaking? Well, we were getting support at gigs for um, bands that uh, were soon to be uh, international, like Metallica and uh, Wow, the, and that... uh, yeah, Anthrax did the f- open the first Metallica tour of the East Coast. Uh, wow, and I was lucky enough to be in the band at that point and experience that, and uh, you know, it was great. It was great. Man, I tell me about that. I mean, as a kid. Going out in support of Metallica on mm. your first, that was, was that your first like real tour? Uh, you know, it was a group of dates. I wouldn't really call it a tour because we were, we were ping ponging from home to wherever we needed to go. It was probably, um, and I don't remember the exact venues, but it was probably um, anywhere from Boston to DC, if I had to guess. Okay. The same, it was the same um, uh, section of, of, uh, of uh, real estate that White Lion used to tour. Okay, right on, yeah. man. Uh, um, at that point, too, Metallica, uh, you know, they were just young punk kids, right, from West Coast. So they, was there kind of yeah, they were brand new. John, you know, we had gotten to know John Zazula um, by going out to his um, his um, shop at the uh, Old Bridge uh, Flea Market, okay. and uh, you know, we were just trying to to get a leg up. Hey, why don't you do something with us? You know, that kind of thing. And um, he said, hey, I got this new band that I'm bringing out from the West Coast called Metallica and um, played us a tape. And we we're like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. And <laughs> nothing then, groundbreaking for you that. Yeah, no. Well, they needed a rehearsal room and we were rehearsing at this place called the Music Building in Jamaica, Queens, which was this six or seven story rundown uh, office building that had outlived its useful life. And uh, somebody, uh, some entrepreneur uh got it and and divided it up into rehearsal rooms. So you would walk up the stairs and uh, there would be, I don't know, maybe half a dozen uh, drywalled rooms on each level and it's cheap rent. Nothing in between, no no soundproofing. It's just all. Hardly, yeah. yeah. Uh, And we would, uh, you know, we would um, play there, um, rehearse there. It's funny, you know, we had the room next to Marshall Crenshaw. Do you know Marshall Crenshaw? Of course, yeah, yeah. Mania and he awesome. a solo career. Yeah. Anyway, he had the room right next door to us. And in those days, Anthrax had uh, 12 guitar cabinets on each side of the drum riser. Oh my God. They were all on. You know, in they rehearsal were, even. In rehearsal. They weren't. Oh the, and and uh, the guitar players had uh, first uh, generation uh, wireless systems. You'd just gotten them. They were new toys. So they would leave me in there. Everything was on 10 through 24 cabinets. They would leave the door open. They would go in the hallways and play. And Marshall Crenshaw would walk into the room. He'd come storming into the room, screaming his head off at me. <laughs> it's just you. You're the only one in there. Like, like, I was the only one there to, to scream at. So and, obviously uh, you had a PA set up and your drums were mic'd up. Right? So, so he was so pissed off and we just got the biggest kick out of that. Was this, I mean, on it. Okay. So I got to ask, like, is this just, okay, we got to prep for tour life, man. We got to feel the way it's going to feel on stage. So we're going to uh-huh. plug in all 24. That's the, the idea behind that. I, I, I suppose so. I mean, yeah. I guess we, I guess we just thought that, well, you know, there's 24 amps on Judas Priest stage. So I guess right. they're all on. So Being a kid, on. Man. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Were you a big double bass player then? Uh, I was getting into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was a double bass player and, uh, you know, cutting my teeth. Yeah. I mean, like you did that for a couple of years, right? You were in Anthrax for a couple of years. I was in Anthrax for, yeah, give or take two years, some, something okay. around there. Yeah. Somewhere around there. And, and then I le- came in right after. And then I left um, Anthrax and I joined a band called Cities, which was a new, another New York band that was kind of on the same level at that point. And um, actually, funny enough, Cities opened for Y&T and I got to meet Leonard Hayes and he played right. my band his kit and uh i still have a photo of that somewhere uh, he was a great guy and and just a g- really inspirational drummer uh, so foot. i cities i spent a couple of years with them and um then eventually made my way in, into white lion how did that happen i mean you guys are all from that same area right so we're, you- yeah we're all from the same area i'd seen yeah. the band in a in the club um in Lemoore, uh, and uh, White Lion was managed by um, the two guys that owned uh, the Lemoore clubs, 
And um, uh, I heard kind of late in the game that they were looking for a drummer. Um, there was an ad in the Village Voice. I answered the ad. I was routinely doing that at that point in my life. And um, it happened to be them. And I, and I showed up and I saw the manager of the band and he said, oh, we were looking for you. And I goes, oh, that's great. I wish I would have known that you guys uh, were looking for somebody. And I think I was the last guy in. They saw, they saw a slew of people. And I, I think I was literally the last guy in, and uh, they, they, you know, I got it. So, you know, I like I said, there are some people that are not drummers that watch these chats, right, and musicians. And so um, the catacall thing is really interesting, right, you know, to talk about these auditions. Um, you mentioned uh, Michael Jackson before, uh, Jennifer Batten, and I have talked a lot about her audition. Mm -hmm. And while they had a lot of musicians come in, rather than having them all in this long hallway where Barry Squires is putting everybody together, you know, in this room, she had to walk in and it was just a video camera. Mm. And oh, somebody, really? somebody behind the glass, Michael wasn't there, you know, somebody that was actually, you know, orchestrating the band said, play me something funky. Just give me a rhythm track. And then she did to just plug in and play just with nothing to accompany her. And she said, all right. And they said, uh, you know, play, you know, a couple of lead things. And, and do you know any songs? And she's like, oh, yeah. And so she played a bunch of Michael stuff and then said, I could do like the beat it solo. And that was the nail in the coffin, right? That oh, was yeah. the thing where she, she played that. And um, it's interesting what she talks about that because she said, yeah, I just, there was, there was no vibe in the room. You know, you walked in, you were nervous because you can't see anybody. You're just hearing this voice come through the, through the uh, intercom. And she said, um, I knew that there were so many people in that gig, like thousands of guitars that they looked at and then narrowed it down to hundreds or whatever. And uh, she said it was weeks before she even heard back. And then wow. she got the call. And I imagine, you know, that's like the first time you hear your song on the radio, you're right. You're just like all the way home, just freaking out. Yeah. When you do the cattle call for White Lion, you said there yeah. were a ton of people ahead of you. Is this one of those deals where, you know, you're sitting in a, in a lobby waiting to go in next and they've got a kit set up and uh, well, there was a kid set up, but there was there was nobody. Uh, there was no line. I think they had um, already gone through that process. And, um, you know, I sh showed up. The guys were just kind of warming up and they looked at, like they had really had enough oh, yes. of, of listening to a bunch of different drummers, honestly. And um, and, uh, you know, I just uh, played what I thought was appropriate for the songs that they had given me. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and I was right. Did you remember what you auditioned? What I auditioned? Yeah. What songs? Uh, yeah. I remember the white lion songs that I auditioned. They were all off the fight to survive record. Um, yeah. you know, and then, um, uh, all the fallen men, kid of a thousand faces for anybody that remembers this record. It was really a great record. Yeah. Um, um Broken Heart, which wound up being on our last studio record. Um, record, I guess I'm dating myself, huh? That's all right. The records are big again, remember? Oh, are they? Good. Yeah, vinyl's huge. <laughs> um, it's really funny. You know, I was talking to, not to get off the subject, but I was talking to uh, my wife and I said, you know what? I, I moved all these records that I've had for years. My, my whole vinyl collection was in storage for 30 years. I pulled it out and I had to build a closet to put all the records in, right? Nice. So in the interim... Um, I had, uh, uh, racks and racks of CDs that I got over the years. And now those CDs reside in, in those, um, binders. Right? Okay. Yeah. Just got rid of the cases and got rid of the cases, put them yeah. on binders. So I just had, I wanted to get my, my, uh, my catalog for my car. Now it's all on this. Everything. That's so great, man. Isn't 164 that 64 so nice, gigabyte man? drive. Yep, man. And it's just, uh, it's getting smaller, you know, right. I, uh, you got a couple of drummers in the chat right here. Uh, Caleb Rankin, my son, wicked drummer. Oh. Uh, he's, he's pimping five star, but, uh, uh, Caleb was a huge Neil Peart fan. Like Neil oh, was yeah. God to him. Right. Yeah. And, uh, it was, it was crazy. Right? Yeah. And I, I was going to ask, cause I told him growing up, you know, I was more of the Bonham school, right. That was more where I came from, like the, the thing that resonated with me. Um, and of course, Neil was incredible, right? I mean, he was yeah. inspirational. Um, but if I had choice between going to watch one of those guys, I would have gone to listen to Bonham, right? Right. I've, I've seen Neil a bunch of times and, uh, and I always had to think, right? I'm always counting. I'm always thinking and, and analyzing stuff. And with Bonham, you just felt it. Yeah. So I'm curious. I mean, were you, a, did you, did you come from one of those two schools? 
Um, honestly, both a little bit. I, I um, started getting into Rush um, when I was about 13 or 14 years old, and I saw the Hemispheres tour, wow. saw the Moving Pictures tour um, at, you know, at the Paramount Theater in New York City, which was a thousand seats. You know, what a great year that, Hemis that Hemisphere uh, tour was. We saw Jeff Beck with Simon Phillips that year. Oh. We saw uh, Ozzy Osbourne with Randy Rhodes. Oh, man. Um, and, and just a, a ton of great bands. You know, I mean, everybody that uh, wound up being, you know, our go-to inspirational artists. Um, but, um, yeah, Neil Peart was, was uh, the bar. He was the goal. You know, you yeah. want to figure out how, how to play what he played and, and get that good. And it was difficult. Yeah. You know? And took a long time yeah. uh, to, to learn everything that he did and, and how he physically approached, you know, sat and approached everything and, you know, how he was able to articulate the way he did. Um, the professor. Yeah. That's why. yeah. But that said, I, I too am, a, you know, a diehard Bonham freak. And uh, he is my favorite drummer as well. All, okay. all those 70s English guys, Cozy Powell, Ian Pace, yeah. you know, um, just love how those guys play. It, you know, you talked about the technology, right? How small we can get the music data. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me and I love it so much. And as a guy who owned a recording studio, you probably appreciate all those isolated tracks that have come out with John, yeah. right? When you yeah. hear Bonham and Fool in the Rain, you can hear him grunting while he's playing. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, he's, you can tell he's a little inebriated going into the studio, right? He's like mumbling and, you know, he's stumbling around and then one, on, the da on the downbeat. Two, there you go. Dude. One, <laughs> two, three. And then as soon as the downbeat, it is so precise and yeah. so perfect. I get goosebumps, man. You know, it feels so good. You can hear like this ghost stroke so well when it's all isolated, you know, and, and uh, um, you know, I know we're nerding out for you non-drummers here, but uh, it's as somebody who may not be a drummer, they know what they liked to feel, right? When you listen right. to these songs, you think, I don't know what it is about that feel, but it feels really good, right? Especially like that song, right? Or like, you know, The Ocean or Black Dog or any of those, you know, but um, Lance Kreider here, he is a wicked drummer here in the Portland area. I'm up in Portland, Oregon, by the way, but, uh, yeah, he's had great national bands and it's cool that you are an inspiration. You're an inspiration for a lot of guys. Oh, I, grew, I grew up in Montana, right? So I, oh, wow. I, uh, I grew up in Bozeman, Montana in the woods. And so when white lion broke, I lived miles from any, my nearest neighbor and I'd get my kit set up. Like I said, I was the crazy scorpions fan and kiss and all the, the, the bands. I'd put my drums outside. Cause I could blast the double bass and hear no, the echo down the canyons. Yeah. It's, it's great now, but uh, you know, back then I'm sure my parents were just like, Oh man, the, <laughs> the, the serenity and the solitude of the You're woods. Scaring the not... Buffalo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The bears are, but uh, I, um, I remember just, you know, we'd have to drive so many hours to get to a show, yeah. but you guys came through Billings, Montana, uh, one of those tours. And I caught that one. I um, remember that. Yeah. It, yeah, man. Um, it, it, you know, I was just into, drumming. And I mean, I just, I, you know, played it a couple of years by that point. And, uh, I remember my world was changed completely. My dad brought me to a chick Korea show where I saw, Oh, wow. From Patitucci, and I freaked out. I ran backstage and I was telling Dave, like, I have never seen anything like this. I've got an uncle who was a wicked jazz drummer from Chicago and I'd seen him play, but he was so reserved. Right. And Weckl is nothing reserved right? Right. just over the top. Yeah. And, um, you know, and while I did not become a crazy fusion jazz drummer, you know, it opened my eyes to the complexity, you know, behind drumming beyond just bombastic and, and, and all those, all those simple things too, you know, the stuff that would go into making the drums musical, you know, I mean, it really, uh -huh. you could create melodies with that kind of stuff. And, yeah. um, so when you were getting into these bands, right, you had the Anthrax run, you had Cities, you had um, White Lion. When you got into the White Lion thing, the band was already established and you were like the last to come in. They had James and Vito. and, and The band was established. Um, uh, the ry rhythm section that recorded the first record, um, uh, the bass player and the drummer left individually at different times. Um, the bass player uh, that was in the band when I joined was Dave Spitz. Went on to play with Black Sabbath. Yeah, Dan's um, brother. That's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. The anthrax thing comes around again. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. a small incestuous circle. Right. Uh, so I played with Dave for about a year or two, and then he left the band to um, to join Black Sabbath. And uh, then we auditioned some bass players, and uh, James Lomenzo uh, got that slot. And uh, 
that's the lineup that went on to record Pride and and the rest of the records throughout right. pretty much to the end. The run, yeah. I you know um, from what I can remember, at least uh, I really dug James playing. Yeah. Um, as a drummer, you know, it's so important to have that pocket for the rhythm uh -huh. section. Uh -huh. uh, you know, switching bass players in the middle of your tenure, at least at the beginning of your tenure, was it kind of a weird, odd feeling to learn the songs one way and then it completely changes things up? Maybe people might, might not think so, but with a bass player change, it's it's a different gig. Yeah, no, we spent a lot of time in the rehearsal room um, working up the Pride record and really just, you know, doing just that, gelling it and, and, and becoming a band. And uh, it, it took a minute, you know, we were, you know, I think I was 20 or 21 when I joined White Lion. Um, and, um, you know, those that time that we spent in the basement of Lemoore, rehearsing every day, pretty much. And, uh, you know, just gelling and, and getting better uh, paid off. And, um, you know, that's why we were able to record the first record in such a short amount of time. And, uh, you know, everything was muscle memory at that point for us. The timing was great. Yeah, really we for the, MTV, well the I mean, the, the MTV era, right? And you had, you know, you had the looks, you got the songs, the big hooks, you know, it was the perfect time to put yeah. out, you know, like it, when, when Wait came out, it became, you know, like, like yeah, on the hour, every hour, right? It was, uh, it was the song that kind of, kind of started that, that whole um, genre, like that shift, you know, in those bands where it wasn't just pretty, you know, there's a lot of substance behind it. I know, like extreme was breaking right and and Nuno like um, the people a lot of people compare Nuno and Vito to you know these amazing complex new the next Van Halen generation right mm -hmm. uh, and um I, you know I I think uh, while I loved the songs I was secretly uh, resentful that Tramp was always getting the attention because you know sure he's the front guy and he's pretty you know but I'm like dude the rest of the band is awesome right so was that a, a drag like doing press conferences and and media where you're like oh yeah well there are three other guys in the band but yes well you know I honestly have to say the first time I saw the band as a spectator before I was before I was in the band obviously um, I looked at Tramp and I said that guy's going to be on the cover of Circus yeah you know and uh, so uh, I kind of always saw it as a benefit honestly sure. um yeah to a certain degree i guess it pigeonholed us but and it might have uh played into our uh demise our untimely demise but um no i don't think it was a negative at all i think uh that uh we benefited from it tell me about the demise what what do you mean by that like oh was it, you know just the rock era that that i well i think all of it i think you know the band the band splitting up and um and, uh, you know, the genre not becoming the, uh, you know, losing its status as the uh, as the premier uh, uh, preferable uh, genre to listen to. You know, everybody says that grunge kind of took away uh, um, hair metal or heavy metal or whatever it was, however you want to categorize it at that point. I never I never thought that I, I you know, I saw uh, um, a very obvious shift of. Um, you know uh, the big light shows and and this and the sparkle the sparkle walls and all that kind of stuff that we had in um, hair bands went to country mm, yeah. genre you know grunge and all that stuff was a completely different thing that was more like a seventies thing you know that was really it was more played down they weren't yeah. wearing the flat flashy clothes or anything like that their music had a different message you know it was more seventies metal went to Nashville. Yeah, yeah, it really did, and and consequently, yeah. right? Then the country sound really became a rock and roll sound, which is uh, yeah. You know, any without the twang, every country song seems to be it's it's another rock pop song, you know. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Did, were you one of those guys that made the jump down to Nashville? A lot of people did. No, no, I got out to L.A. and uh, fell in love with the weather. And uh, yeah, after Zach's band, I said, well, you know, let's figure out how to stay here and build a life and do what I want to do. So you joined Zach Wild's band when you went moved to LA. We joined Zach Wild. You know, um, White Lion opened for um, Ozzy Osbourne uh, in '89, and um, you know, uh, Zach and I and James Lomenzo uh, developed a friendship, and we started playing together on days off, and it just kind of naturally um, morphed in, into a band, you know, and um, played with him up until 1994. 
Okay. Yeah. I was thinking about the time in which things changed for Zach. Um, you know, I've known a lot of guys that played with him. Uh, um, uh, Chad Zalinga, you probably know probably well, dr wicked drummer, but he did Black Label Society gig for a while. And mm -hmm. um, Breaking Benjamin was his gig. And um, I remember him telling me about how different Zach is now from mm -hmm pre sober Zach, you know, okay. and, yeah. uh, and when you were playing with him, that was probably in the height of his, uh, drinking days, right? Zach was, uh, he's a, party guy. a very capable drinker back in. Yeah. The <laughs> yeah. That's called professional, right? He's yeah. a professional. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I've been there, man, yeah. I, you know, but I, I, um, I just know that, you know, I talked about the camaraderie, right. Mm -hmm. How that relationship building is man, when there's any of that, and then you've got a couple of guys who have level head that just makes it impossible to run a business. You know, I mean, you've, you've really, you seem to be one of those guys that recognizes trends and recognizes the business end of things, you know, to, to sort of keep the professional side mm -hmm. and probably recognize some of that stuff. I mean, I, I, I don't know what the reasoning behind the end of that tenure, but I know that that was the end of a lot of Zach's relationships because, you know, he just, he'd like the bottle more than people sometimes. So the, uh, um, so after, so that was the first gig that transitioned to LA. Was it weird? I mean, you said you fell in love with the weather. I know New York mm. winters are tough, man. I mean, Montana winters are tough, right? Yeah. But uh, do you, uh, you still have family back on the East coast? Yeah. I still have family back on the East coast, you know, I speak to them uh, often, always invite them out if they want to get away from the snow, if they finally want to put down that shovel, um, yeah. you know, it's kind of trendy to leave LA these days. Right. And, uh, I understand that. Um, but uh, it's still a great place, and I and I, I really enjoy living here right now. I, I, I my son Caleb there has been looking between you know like Santa Monica and San Diego everywhere in between, yeah. and he's he's just desperate to. He's th thinking about moving to Montana again because he knows that he can afford a house or he's working on buying a house, and yeah, it's pretty tough down there. You know, he's it he, is found tough. he found something at Chino that he's considering, and he said, uh, "Yeah, it's a little ways out, but you know, you're driving no matter what when you're in yeah. LA, right?" So. Uh -huh. Yeah, you. Um, so moving to LA, I was thinking. You already mentioned it. Bringing family out during, they probably say, "Hey, uh, hey, Greg, you know it's February, and uh, you know it's sub zero, and you know we're tired of digging out." Were you? You said you were in the city proper, Long Island. Or? Um, I was in New York City. I grew up in New York City. I was okay. born in Brooklyn and right. uh, raised in Queens and in Manhattan since I was twelve. Man, you know? so I, 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 uh, I was a city I, kid. That uh, the we've been starting tours the last several years pre pandemic at Coney Island at that Ford Amphitheater. Oh, yeah, you know, <laughs> so yeah, I uh, I've gotten really I've fallen in love with the city, you know, it's yeah. one of those places that I love to go visit. I know that winters would be tough, but um, but the not just the weather climate, but the emotional climate is different there. It's hectic, man, it's frantic in a lot of ways, right? And the hustle is so visible with everybody, everybody's got the hustle vibe. You move to LA and even though you still have to hustle, it just seems like it's a little more relaxed, right? It's so, a little, yeah. It's, you know, um, it is, especially in the summertime, you know, you get baked down upon, you know, it acts as like lithium. It just kind of like levels you off a little bit. Uh, at least it does me. I, I love the sun. Um, you know, and, uh, the idea of going through another winter of snow is not appealing. Yeah. That's so tough, man. You know, you probably go look back on those days where you were lugging hardware cases through snow, mm -hmm. right? You're like lift. Yeah. yeah like, sure. Oh, God, man. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. Slipping, stepping in puddles. Ugh. The greatest thing about getting a record deal, right? It's like, I no longer have to carry my shit. Oh, yeah. Literally, literally when we, uh, you know, we got our deal and we came out here to record and, uh, you know, when, when we kind of landed and first couple of days I was here, I was like, wait, I could live here. Oh, okay. I think I'll do that. You know? Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, I oftentimes ask my guests, it's interesting for me, especially as a musician, I like to ask people what their guilty pleasures are. Like people that know Greg D'Angelo, right? Like mm -hmm. people that know you, what would they be surprised to find out? Surprised? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm an open book. I'm, you know, I like cars. Uh, you know, uh, if I'm not, if I'm not hitting my drums, I, uh, I'm wrenching on something. Uh, yeah. oh, so you work on them. Oh yeah. I like, muscle I, cars? I like to get in there. No, not muscle cars. Really. I'm, I'm lucky enough to have one of these. Not, not that, not something yeah. like that, but, um, you know, that, uh, takes up a lot of my time and, um, 
I like driving. You know, that's the other great thing about L.A. You know, I live about 10 minutes away from the road that Jay Leno is constantly uh, serpentining up the hill and, and, you know, when he's demoing his cars. So uh, I, I drive that route a lot. I have, you know, other musician friends that uh, have cars and we go out and and we'll, you know, say, oh, let's do 200 miles today. And we'll go up, uh, you know, through Malibu up into Ojai and, and just have lunch and drive and have a good time. Up the PCH. Yeah. Man, that is such a beautiful view. Uh, you know, your your colleague Ricky Rocket, I know, lived up like sure. sort of last uh, you know, in the, the desert up there. Uh-huh. I went up to his place once, rented the Mustang and just cruised the those uh those hills. And I thought I would live up here just to be able to drive. You know, if you go up through like Topanga Canyon, you know, and yeah. all those areas, it's just so cool. It's, it's so it, beautiful and it's a great day. Yeah, yeah. I um so how about musically? Like if we pried open that, uh, that thumb drive of yours and we were looking at your music, um, and we ran across, you know, whatever, a Britney Spears tune that may be a guilty pleasure, you know, anything like that mm-hmm. that people might say, Oh, Greg, hmm. uh, I appreciate that stuff. I appreciate the production. I, I, uh, you know, after spending so much time in a studio, Max is, you know, her producer is definitely, uh, an inspirational guy. Um, you would find a lot of different things that you go, Oh, that's cool. I didn't know, think you would be listening to that kind of stuff. Um, but the great majority is old 70s stuff, you know, okay. the Bad Company collection. Simon yeah. Kirk is probably is one of my favorite drummers by far. Um, all the Zeppelin, Deep Purple, White Snake, all that stuff. I love those bands. Um, you know, and some some new bands are kind of sound old, like Rival Sons. I really like that. Oh, band. yeah. That's a great um, band. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't draw no lines. You were tra- talking pro- production a second ago. Andrew yeah. Green in the chat here, another wicked drummer who's uh he's been subbing for Pete on the Black and Blue gig actually. Well, uh, oh great. Been, well, he was out with Rat. So Andrew said he loves the production on that uh, last White Lion record. So did yeah. you have because you had this experience in the studio later? Did you kind of have an influence on how you wanted the production to sound? Uh, well, as you go from record to record, you definitely form opinions and. Um, I think uh, the trick is to find people who uh, are going to be on the same page. And, yeah. uh, you know, when when you're kind of going through your hit list of producers and you were in a position like White Lion was where we were getting ready to do our third record for a major, um, you know, we, we loved working with Michael Wagner. We, we loved the success that we had with him. And, um, you know, I think, uh, who knows? I mean, uh, it might have been the kind of thing where if the band were to, were to have gone on, we might have found our way back to him but you know every every band has got to grow and right. and so we went looking for a new producer and uh we loved what richie zito was doing we loved the sounds that he was getting and um it just seemed like a next logical step in our development at that point um and yeah i'm a, I'm a big fan of what we were able to come up with on that record as well huge yeah I mean, your snare drum sounds hey you know was was massive um you SPX know, I, 90. what's that spx 90 and and ambient mics that was really okay you know, yeah. biggest part of it I, yeah we're gonna we're gonna engineer nerd out now this is good <laughs> man. i'm actually heading to the studio tonight uh, in a couple of hours with uh mike skill from the romantics if you oh, know awesome. mike, you yeah. know those guys yeah, yeah. I, I haven't met them but i'm a big fan i love their i love the romantics it's a cool band uh they're all detroit guys their drummer now brad elvis is a chicago guy wicked drummer but uh-huh. Mike Skill lives here, and we're doing a, a live thing for Spin Magazine's Twitch channel. So it'll be cool Great. for me. And I, I was gonna—I only bring that up because studio obviously is a completely different animal than live. Uh-huh. I'm so desperately in need of playing on stage. I need it, man. I want so badly to play a live show. Yeah, uh, it's, you know, it's what I live for. Uh-huh. Studio is a great feeling because you're still getting the the you know the motion out. You're getting emotion and playing, and you're interacting with people, and there's that vibe. Uh, but it's not the same. But it's I mean, not the same. I was excited to get it because I didn't want to play at home. Drums are set up in my place in my studio, and I have no interest in going out there and playing by myself. Right? I mean, that's like to me. And I, I know a lot of my drummer buddies are like, "Dude, this is the time to just get really good." But yeah. you know, for me the most important thing is the vibe that you have with people, both in a band and interacting, you know, getting the energy off people in a show. Right. So yeah. how's it been, how's it been for you, man, during this pandemic? Are you playing? I'm playing, but it's been a drag. I mean, you know, um, I have a new band called um, uh, Legends of Classic Rock with uh, Terry Luce from X from um, 
XYZ and Great White and Sean McNabb. Oh, uh, Sean's playing bass? Yeah, Sean's playing bass. And Danny Johnson is playing guitar. And we have Kevin Jones, who is Ozzy Osbourne's keyboard player. Wow. And we were booked for a solid year, you know. And uh, we did one show in December of uh, 99 and of um, 19 yeah. and uh, came back, regrouped, and started saying, okay, went really good. And we got, we got this incredible offer, and we were booked for a year, and it all went away. And oh, it, they had a whole like years with the dates. Like, they had us uh, scheduled out. We were ready to go, and um, and um, it was a real disappointment. So we've been, you know, we've been playing uh, and, and keeping busy uh, as much as we can. It, um, I play not as often as I would like to play, but um, I'm lucky enough to have a studio in my house. So I'm um, recording tracks for people that uh, call in and ask me to do that. Um, you know, and you do you do what you what you can do, you know, and you do what uh, um, you need to do. And uh, listen, you know, all my all my problems are first world problems. I, right. I, yeah. I it's here. You know, everybody should be in my position. Um, oh, you but, don't get to play on stage. Yeah. yeah. All of our, all, all, everybody watching. Yeah. Like, you know, we have a wonderful agent and he is just as anxious as we are to get us back out there playing and uh we are looking forward to doing just that i bet man like uh, uh how about the piercy days like like i said i saw you last time i saw you was playing with steven at that right. club um and actually black and blue guys were there that night too jamie oh, yeah? and, uh, and brandon were playing they had uh, some backup guys we remember that yeah yeah but uh um so that you know they brought me down but uh you know of course you know, i Let's start with this. I'll give you my Piercy story, and then you can give me one of yours, okay? Okay. <laughs> Before um, A Flock of Seagulls, I played with the 80s pop thing, Animotion. Remember that band, Obsession? Sure. Like, so I was with them for almost 16 years. And uh -huh. the very first time I met Steven, he had his solo band. We did the first Nike run hit wonder in LA. So they had, whatever, 200,000 people running six miles, 10K, and every mile had a stage on it, right? So they oh, had. He told me about this. I remember this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I bet he didn't tell you everything. I mean, yeah, maybe he did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Missing Persons was on the gig. Uh, Animotion did the gig. A Flock of Seagulls did the gig. Stephen Piercy was on the gig, and uh, our guitarist went to the the uh, start line, starting line. He was playing the national anthem to kick it off, right? And. We wait. We're there at seven o'clock in the morning. That's when those marathons start in LA, right? So yeah. no rockers get up at that point, you know, but I'm psyched because this is the first bigger show that I'm doing with that band. This is back in 2002, I think, or 2003. And uh, right around the, the time of the first of the year. And so um, we're waiting and waiting. The guitarist hasn't showed up. We figured he's going to do the national anthem and then jump back on and get on stage and we're all going to play as people are running by and you just do your hits, you know, and, and people will ride by and, you know, they dance a little bit. We're waiting for like 45 minutes and guys are coming by on little carts and on, on radio radios. And, and um, they, I said, is there something wrong? And they said, yeah, there's some, one of the bands is holding this thing up. And I said, Oh no. And this guy said, yeah, it's ridiculous, man. The writers for a band at seven o'clock in the morning. I said, I gotta know which band he goes, I can pierce had to have a case of Seagram's before he would go on stage at seven o'clock in the morning. And the guy said, so thank God, man, we, we, you know, Ralph's was open. So we went out and got him the Seagram's and we, they started the show an hour late, 200,000 people waited for this thing. So I'm betting that's not the only time that this kind of stuff happened with Steven. I've certainly seen and talked to Pete, unfortunately, man. I mean, Pete Holmes is a dear, dear friend of mine. And I love him. I and love Pete. Yeah. He's, he's amazing. Man, drummer. amazing drummer. You know, he's a Portland guy, right? And, and uh, we talked on this show. He was doing, man, I mean, his wife was going through the end of her days in cancer treatment when he was out, when Stephen had his last downfall, right? Right. And it was, it was so hard to see that stuff, you know, see the videos where Pete's looking off into the distance, playing his gig, you know, just doing what he d does. And, and, um, We've all been around people, you know, that have had like those kinds of substance abuse issues, right? Where uh, it's tragic. It's no, it's not funny anymore. I mean, the whole TMZ blabbermouth, you know, kind of, uh, you know, sensationalism to me 
it's gross, you know, because you see somebody like that and you know, they're hurting, you know? Um, I, I think, uh, when I did talk to Steven at that show, after we did the first, um, run hit wonder, he was super cool, super down to earth. Um, he Good. was laid, laid back and he was the night that I saw you play with him too. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if it was because, you know, I was playing another band or whatever. Um, I hadn't heard from people, you know, fans that had met him, that they'd had any issue, but word gets around, right? Reputation. Um, was it a tough gig? Was it a tough gig? Yeah. I mean, you were um, music director on the gig too, right? You're playing drums and. Well, I wasn't really music director. I was kind of, I was kind of acted as, uh, as, as, as band manager really more than anything else. Um, Babysitter. The, the music kind of took care of itself. Um, and it was a, it was a great gig in that because they're, we we're playing the rat catalog and they're great songs. Yeah. You know, and they're fun songs to play. Yeah. Um, so there wasn't a lot, you know, I mean, we were, we were basically playing rat song. It's not like there was a, a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot at risk, let's say, you know, we went out there to play the songs and have a good time. And that was pretty much it. Okay. You know, it's not like, it's like, Oh, well, this is going to be the next Van Halen or this is going to be that, or, you know, it wasn't. You manage uh, your expectations. That, yeah. yeah. That, that's... So you manage, exactly. You manage your expectation and um, have a good time. And I had a good time. Did you? Yeah. Like, man, I, you know, I think about like the White Lion days. You know, I mean, you guys were as big as it gets, right? In that time, playing the biggest festivals. And, you know, I mean, really, I mean, you're you're playing the biggest shows, right? Yeah, you and, had and, a moment. And, yeah, <laughs> man. So tell me, I mean, if you can remember, like, I, you can't forget this stuff. Like, tell me the craziest moment that you think, wow, okay, this is this is going in the book. Oh, boy. Um There's a few, um, you know, being on a roller coaster with Steven Tyler and Joe Perry and um, them constantly, every time we would come down for the end of the ride, them telling the guy that was operating the ride, no, we want to go again. We want to go oh, again. Are like, you a roller coaster guy? Not really. And, no, we, okay. did it, and we went, we went a dozen times <laughs> and I wound up vomiting. But, and, <laughs> but, but the good thing is Steven picked me up and wiped me down. So, you know, Tyler. yeah, so that was, uh, oh my God. He was kind of just like, uh, you know, just more, 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 you know, which was which was great. There were a few moments like that. And, uh, you know, the friends that you make, um, yeah. the relationships that you build over the uh, over the years, um, you know, some of them, you know, some of them have maintained to this day. And, uh, you know, and we, we have great laughs and it's great to speak to uh, people that I got along with and, uh, you know, and, and, and like this kind of share memories. And yeah. And, uh, you know, and uh, just kind of a recap on on what a great time we had. That is really what this show is kind of about, right? Like yeah. I started I started doing it just with our guitarist from the Flock of Seagulls. He's up in uh -huh. Toronto, right? And we were reminiscing and 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 also commiserating that wow, we had the biggest touring year of our life booked this year, right? And so um, they canceled over seventy five shows, and we had some big ones. And it's crazy that. The 80s pop thing is big right now. You know, I'm always blown away when 10 year olds and 30 year olds and 60 year olds are at these shows, you know, but mm -hmm. so we were talking about it and just had it live on Facebook and Jennifer Patton called me and she said, you know, you've got a knack for just, you know, making people feel comfortable. You should do it with your buddies. And I started just reaching out to guys like Pete and, and other drummer buddies. I mean, you probably know. Like, you know, every one of the drummers, Nate Warren's a dear friend of mine and Nate and I, we're roller coasters. That's what we, oh, call that's it. Great. we go to magic mountain and we hit all the, yeah. magic, hit all the rides and but Glenn Sobel's a dear oh, friend and, and, and Glenn, um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about real stuff and being vulnerable and kind of like open about this. A lot of people that may not be musicians, but had always wondered like, wow, you know, that guy seems so approachable, right? I mean, guys that didn't meet Greg D'Angelo and could see like, you know, yeah, you're, you're, you know, unassuming and and intelligent and business driven, and also you like fun and, you know, you're into cars. People wouldn't get that from reading Blabbermouth, you know. Probably and, not. And it's, um, I like the authenticity, right? Oh. Like I said, I'm not Howard Stern, man. I'm not looking for dirt. When I was asking about Piercy, um, man, I mean, I was one of those guys, you know, in in a certain respect. I didn't drink. I was never. I was sober until I had kids like late twenties. Right. And, uh, and then I tried to make up for it for about 10 years. I had a good run of where I was a professional 
right? <laughs> I, I had, uh, and, um, and it got crazy, right? Because I was living the 80s life in the, you know, 2000. And, yeah. uh, uh, and then I'd tour. And when we go overseas or we go to Canada, I feel like, ah, oh, I'm not in the US, so I can be a different guy, right? And um, I realized, man, it was a liability. You know, I, I it never, uh, thank God, it never really became an issue with bands. But one of the local promoters that works with a bunch of bands with some of the guys that are here in the chat and, and some of my bands, one of the guys said, Hey, I'm putting together this tribute act and you've got a great network of people and you're a great player. You're the right guy for it, but maybe, you know, tone down the drinking before you do the show. It's the first person and only person to ever say something to me. And wow. I, uh, I remember, man, it stuck with me. That was, you know, 10 years ago, maybe a little more. Yeah. And, um, and then I got the DUI like shortly oh, after cool. that. And, uh, you know, a lot of musician friends of mine, you know, I talked to about it. They said, oh, dude, that's a rite of passage. And I didn't see it that way. Right. I mean, I'm a dad. I don't know if you've got kids, but for I me, do, yeah. yeah, yeah, I have two boys who are becoming teenagers. And yeah. I, you know, sat and I, and I blew right at point away at the limit. And all those guys were like, oh, man, you should get a lawyer. You can beat this thing. And I thought, time to grow up. You know, mm -hmm. really, I mean, if, uh, you know, I wasn't out partying, I was at a business meeting, having wine, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I would have first thought to justify it, but then I started thinking about all the relationships that I have, band relationships, business relationships, and the example I had to set as a dad, you know, I mean, you know, if you're a father, sure, the, 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 like our kids are going to listen to 10% of what we say, right. But yeah. they're watching everything you do. Yeah. And I don't know, I, like my kids now are 21 and 19 and yeah. all they do is watch. Right. I mean, really anything I say is going to go in, in one ear and out the other, but they're watching everything I do. Yeah. And, um, the, it's just strange, right. To grow up at this age. Right. I think about you guys going through the eighties and the nineties, early nineties, when it was just bombastic and there's, you know, there's money flowing and booze and drugs and chicks and everything else. Uh, was how was that for you man were you able to kind of like keep a level head through all that stuff pretty much white lion was we were choir boys we uh really? we really didn't uh abuse any substances at all maybe you know one or two beers too too much at, at any given point but that's about as far as it went um yeah and uh you know but I, I grew up, uh, you know, in New York City, freewheeling at 12 years old in Manhattan, working for a scalper. That was my first gig. You know, no being, way. Yeah, kind of like being a Smurf at Madison yeah. Square Garden, waiting online with a wristband. Um, that's how I got to see all the great shows. Um, but uh, you know, compared that to uh, the experience my kid is having, it's it's day and night. I am a helicopter father. Yeah. I watch every move. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a girl? No, I have a boy. Okay. Yeah. I, I was hel helicopter dad for sure with the first yeah. and the second I realized, you know, you know they'll be okay. You know, but yeah. I, uh, um, you know, you mentioned the garden just now. So you've played it, right? We were lucky enough. Yeah. That was kind of like my goal. And we yeah. were lucky enough. We got to open for ACDC at the garden. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's not a bad gig, man. Yeah, no, it was sold out show and uh, <sighs> time of my life. You know, uh, that's certainly on my bucket list, right? Uh, our singer's done it, you know, but uh, but not with us. Um, yeah. But it's on the list. It's, you know, and maybe, you know, the way they put together these 80s bands is, you know, we do a lot of like package tours where we play with, you know, Wang Chung and, and uh, you know, Boy George and all these things. And, you know, so they could fill those kind of rooms. That's right. But um, Red Rocks is the one on top of my list. Yeah, I've that never was played you've done that one i'm sure i did yeah we yeah. played that we played at red rocks with uh geez i think um gee who was it i, I don't remember maybe it was aerosmith okay but wow. what i do remember is bon jovi was was backstage with us on that gig and we were clowning around with them that was good fun but i, I think uh we were opening for aerosmith at that point what a great gig too another yeah. one it's throwing all gonna be sold out just throwing these names around like yeah you know, yeah, like heard oh, yeah. of yeah, heard of Madonna. Yeah, I've heard of yeah. yeah. Partying with the Queen and then, uh, <laughs> right, the Rothschilds yeah. were there. Right, Richard awesome. Branson flew me in on his jet, and uh, yeah, then Elon Musk now is making a special Tesla just for me. Yeah. Are you a fan of of EV cars, sports cars? Uh, uh, I can appreciate them, and and I think uh, you know what what the some of the uh, 
brands are doing with the hybrids is incredible. You know, the, uh, the break your neck uh, off the line speed that they're getting is really something else. Um, but yeah, it's uh, zero to 60 like in. gas. Yeah. I like, I like the smell of gas and I like the, the noise that sucking carburetors make. Yeah, man. I, uh, I know you're a Ferrari guy, but uh, like, what's your dream car? Like if any, if money was no object and they said, uh, Hey, Greg, here's a key. What is it? Well, you know, I mean, geez, I guess uh, I'd love to have a GTO, you know, like a, a Ferrari GTO, but that's kind of like, you know, either which is like the Hyde number car, or I'd love to have a, a Lamborghini Miura. I love those oh, yeah. too. Okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, you're, um, you're not a big guy. For me, not really. I, I tried to get into a McLaren and, and McLaren and Lambos. Too yeah. small for me, you know. I, yeah. I I need a bigger ride, but uh, that they just don't make them for large men, you know. So the uh, yeah, actually, McLarens are pretty good. You know, the way they have the seats, uh, they slope down a little bit. You could how tall are you? I'm I'm just five eleven, but I'm a large chested really? man. Oh, okay. But yeah, but you know what? And it wasn't even just like w to get in. That was the hard part, like getting into it because the getting the, in is tough. That was the hard part. Yeah, yeah I had getting to in like swing my butt in and then pull yeah. my legs in and, and around. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that doesn't but once look you, sexy. Once you're kind of settled in there and you're in position, yeah, it, there's, and, you have enough headroom. That's like yeah. a roller coaster. It is. Yeah, yeah. man. Uh, that my roller coaster. Yeah. I will take it, man, <laughs> for sure. I, you know, I, uh, I am a big fan of the muscle cars and yeah. Uh, a lot of my musician friends, like up here, this is what they've done in their pandemic. You know, their guitar, their their really their garage is cleared out. There's no music equipment. They just been putting together hot rods. And no, that's you great. Know, I'll, I'll pop in and see like the Chevelles, and you know, they're, yeah, they're, they, uh, it's fun. Yeah, man. I I, uh, I just I watched them spin wrenches. You know, like you talked about Jeff Beck earlier. Mm. That dude, you know, Batten has had these crazy stories about Jeff Beck. She's another one, you know, she'll throw names around, right? She'll say, oh, Jeff Beck invited me over for his wedding, right? So he uh, he came to pick me up and we, he picked me up in this little roadster. And so it had a little rumble seat in the back. And she said, you know, we were traveling through, you know, out of London to go back out to his castle. And he said, oh, yeah, this is the street where, you know, I see Jimmy all the time. And she said, oh, there's Jimmy now. Jimmy Page is walking up the street and he says, hey, are you coming to the reception? And they had the wedding and a little reception in a pub that held, I guess, like a hundred people. Yeah. And Jeff Beck had set up so that Jimmy Page, I think it was like Daltrey, uh, McCartney, uh, trying to think of like Vinny Colliot is playing as well. Like the, oh, Clapton, like the biggest names in rock and roll history in this pub where if a bomb went off, right, there's no rock and roll left. Right. Oh, but, no. uh, but it's so funny. You know, she talks about this, like you and I are talking about going to Starbucks, you know, yeah, and, yeah. you know, she, she, um, she's very humble. You know, I love the humility and it seems like you've got that too, man. I mean, that's probably what keeps you grounded more than anything. Right. Is you've seen guys that attitude is just, uh, cost them dearly. Right. Yeah. Well, I count my blessings. There's no two ways about it. What's your dream gig? Oh, my dream gig? Yeah. Uh, I guess playing with Led Zeppelin. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. You know, like everybody else. And yeah, man, I don't know that I would want that game. I mean, that would, they, I'd love to play those songs. I'd love to take a tour in that one, you know? Yeah, like, I mean, it, it, you know, on second thought, boy, the eyes on you would be... Uh, oh, especially now. Searing. Yeah, unless you're Jason, you just, you know, you unless can't you're win. You he can't does do a great the great job. And even more so now, like I've been watching with Sammy, yeah. you know, the dude yeah. has just grown like every yeah, year. I agree. You see, it's awesome to see. I agree. I, and I, I think uh, I heard like sobriety has been good to him too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh -huh. it, uh, I mean, he watched dad take a pretty horrific turn. Right. So yeah. Yeah. There's a Lamborghini yeah. Huracan fan out there. Hi, Mike. The, uh, uh, my uh, man, I just, I have to say um, getting to rap this way, is really really fun. I'm hopeful that when the pandemic is done, I'm going to come track you down. We're going to go Please for do. a roller coaster. We're going to go to Magic Mountain. Please Actually, I, I, I'm supposed to play Catalina in about uh, six eight weeks. Um, Give me a call. I'll take you for a ride up the two, and we'll uh, maybe we'll run into Jay Leno. Oh my god, that sounds so good, man. Yeah, so you're, you're going to take me out in your Ferrari. Yeah. Hey, what Absolutely. what we should do is just drive up to Dave uh, Medicati's place and say, dude, sorry, you know, rock star. <laughs> oh, <hard to. laughs> I love him. Yeah, man. Yeah.
I uh, I really want I uh, you saved the day today. You know, no Tawny Katane. All oh. these uh, these guys going out to look. There was a picture of you and Tawny that I found out there. What was I that love, with, with I you? Love and Tawny. Tawny's Tawny's just the greatest, and uh, I'm sure whatever whatever happened was uh, really really needed her attention because she's not the type of person. She's all business. She's she, she yeah. Gig, you know, I mean, great her, lady. Her follow up message said, "I'm so I am so." meticulous about making sure that I honor my commitments. Yeah, so either. I'm sorry. And yeah, so I, I'm grateful to see that. Right. I mean, uh, but uh, so you've known her for a while. Um, few years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like this, um, we met as well in one of those eighties things, you know, we had uh -huh. a gig in the Dominican Republic and it was eighties uh -huh. in the sand and uh, like Sebastian Bach and Brett Michaels and, and, you know, like along with, the eighties pop bands, but she was one of the the hosts there for that. So yeah. that's kind of a nice thing to get those. And you do something like that too. I, 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 I know I'm going a little bit long, but you've been that's the okay. counselor for rock and for the, um, the, um, rock, the rock, the rock, fantasy, rock camp. fantasy camp. That's right. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I've done and, that. That was great fun. That's cool. Who was, uh, who were the other artists that you were putting the bands together with? Um, well, eat, you know, there are a bunch of counselors that, yeah. that, um, uh, each take on a group a group of musicians and uh, you kind of build out your band and you learn a few songs and you play but um, we uh, the one that I did uh, Judas Priest was the uh, was the featured act so we learned a lot of Judas Priest songs and, and performed those and um, you know there were uh, uh, a lot of great uh, musicians associated uh, with the camp that I did Vinny Apice and Tony Franklin nice. and um, Gee, who else was at that one? Uh, Craig Goldie, oh, uh, yeah. Sarzo. You know, I mean, all names that you would definitely want to hang out with. Yeah. Um, it's a great experience. It really is. And uh, if you have the wherewithal, I highly recommend checking it out. Yeah. Um, guys, if you're watching this and you're looking at the chat right now, uh, that Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp is one of those opportunities where you get to learn from like the biggest music names in the, like the rock business. And they teach you how to play the songs. They teach you about attitude. They kind of talk about, you know, sort of the, the magic behind the stage and all that. And I've had some friends that went down and did it and Glenn counselor a little bit and Tommy Thayer, you know, I've talked to those yeah. guys about it and they, I, uh, um, Tommy's another one. He's a Portland guy, right? Black and blue. He's a, a Is he? dude. Uh -huh. yep. And, and I just, I love seeing, these, you know, good things happen for him. Right. You know, I mean, he's, yeah. he's done all right with the kiss gig and, uh, uh, yeah, he's, he's a great know, guy. Great. You, talk, you talked about being band manager. I mean, really that's kind of, you know, next to doc McGee, he was that guy for kiss for so long. And, uh, right. you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, he's a great player. Really, really good guy. I just saw that he was reunited with a daughter. He didn't know he had, did you hear about that? I didn't. Yeah. Just like, um, uh, I Heart radio put it out yesterday or the day before that uh, wow. he has a daughter who's um, in the Navy or the Marines. And she's uh, she finally tracked him down and said, Hey, you know, I didn't want to contact you for a long time. And I guess they met some years ago, but they just talked about it. Now they've been getting together during the pandemic and, and uh, it's pretty cool, man, because he's always one of those guys that uh, you could tell he'd be a great dad, right? That's he's fantastic. So, he's so quiet, you know, and, and, uh, reserve. You, you think about somebody in kiss, you know, you think about, you know, the Gene Simmons, you know, or, or even ACE, right. You know, just like, well, but Tommy's mm -hmm. so mellow, you know, yeah. it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's cool. It's, uh, it's nice to see, but so are you, man. I, I mean, really, I love your demeanor. It's great to see that, uh, you know, you're holding on tight. You got this gig, um, coming up. So how do people find out about the band with you and Sean McNabb and, you can go to L O C R B A N D legends of classic rock band. So, okay. but, but you don't have to spend all that time putting all those things in your browser, just L O C R B A N D.com. All right. I'm going to put this right here in your, uh, in your little footer so that, uh, people can copy it down. They can go out and find you. And, um, if you guys are watching, you ha <clears throat> have you been, if you've not yet subscribed, please do hit this channel, hit the subscribe button below, and uh, hit the little bell. You'll be notified when you have the other have other shows. I've got some really cool guests. I mean, another you know buddy drummer who's another local guy, Dean Castronovo is going to be on next week. And say uh, hi to Dean for me. Yeah, I will, man. He, he uh, yeah, Dean and I go a long way back as well. And um, you know, it seems like he's uh, he's one of those guys, man, that just keeps getting back up, right? You know, yeah. you know knock down, keep him get back up, and that uh, the resilience 
you know, which we have to do now. The pandemic makes everybody have to do sure. it. Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, if you go to All Access Live, youtube.com slash all access live and subscribe. I'm going to re-air this on Facebook tonight at 7 p.m. So if you guys just came in late and you want to share the news, I'm going to rebroadcast it and then go out there and find legends of classic rock and find all these, uh, these all-stars when the pandemic ends and you can go see them live. And I'm going to come try to find you in May and we're going to go ride in your Ferrari and we're going to, I'll look forward to it. Come over to Catalina. It'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Greg, thank you so much, man. Last minute, you just came in, swooped in like a hero. Thank you My so pleasure, much. My pleasure, Kevin. Thank you. It was really uh, a lot of fun. It was. Thanks yeah. again. Thanks, everybody, for watching.